Hi. I used to have a lot of what am I doing moments in my life. What is what am I doing moments? It's basically moments when I said, what am I doing? And it happens when I know I want to go for A, but when I made a decision, I decided to go for B, which is something that I don't really want. So I think one of the biggest what am I doing moment happened in my life and I was in my last year in high school at the time, a long, long time ago, uh, when we were in our last year in high school, we need to choose whether we wanted to, to go for a natural science major or social science major. So of course I knew I want to be in social science. I love language, economy, geography, history, everything that is taught there. But then I go for the natural science major. And the day I decided that I would go for that major, I said to myself like three seconds later, what am I doing? What am I doing here? And it was basically the most miserable year in my entire school life because I hate all the, all the lessons, math, chemistry, physics, oh my God. Um, and so I, I asked myself, what am I doing? I hate going to school every morning and I spend my time in class writing fiction and reading novels. Um, so at the time I asked myself, why am I doing this? So, you know, after asking what, what am I doing, knowing that I made the wrong decision, I asked myself, why am I doing this? Why am I making this decision knowing full well that I'm going to be miserable here, knowing that this is not what I really want? And then I realized that it was because most of the popular students choose natural science. My teachers told me and told us that, hey, you're, an, you're a straight A student, you're smart, so you should go to natural science. I think I want my parents to be proud of me. They would be proud if you know, I go to this major, natural science, so I decided that I'll, I'll go there. So I decided to make this decision based on the title that everyone else given me. They said, you're one of the popular girls, you're smart, you should be here. And I listened to them, neglecting what I really think I should be. I think in life later on, I realized that we did sometimes live our life based on the title other people gave us. What our parents told us, what our teacher told us, our race, our culture, our religion, it becomes boxes that dictates how we should live our lives. And that was the first time when I realized that how dangerous it is when you live your life because you are living the life that someone entitled you to instead of choosing a life that you want for yourself. And I realized at the time, I fear being rejected. I want to be accepted. I want to be one of the smart and popular girls. So I chose that way. After a while, I realized it was not as important because I was miserable. So after I graduated from high school, I decided that I didn't want to go for the same mistakes. I chose social major for my university days. I know that there are only three things I want to study for. Either it's communications, travel and tourism, or language. So I enrolled to these classes and I got accepted for communications. And I think it was, I can feel the big difference when I choose something that I really like and I choose it because I want it, because at the time all, I think my friends, it was the boom of information technology and management information, so everybody goes for that. It was the days when internet was booming, so everybody takes that. I said, no, I'm going to pick what I really want this time because I didn't want to have a miserable four years in university. So I decided to choose what I like, and it was a totally different thing. I love going to school, to university every single day. I do my assignments really well because I just love it. If they ask me to do a minimum of two pages of essays, I'll submit four because <laughs> I just really loved it. I didn't even think about getting good grades. It's just because I really loved it. And I think one of the uh, most um, amazing moments happened when I had an assignment from my lecturer, Mr. Yanis Jesse, in the class of professional studies. He asked us, like the students, to create a portfolio, a personal portfolio of ourselves. 
It contains our CV, our achievements, recommendation letters from our friends, our peers, or our lecturers, and also our values, our thoughts about the world. What do we want to do when we graduated? What are some of our professional values? What kind of changes that we want to do and we want to see in the world? I think that was the first time, maybe I was 19, 18, 19, trying to figure things out, things like this that I've never thought about before. I never thought about what is my values in life. I never thought about what do I want to do after I graduate, how do I get there, and what kind of person I would like to become. I never thought about what kind of changes I can make in the world, or what kind of world I want to see. I never really thought about that before. We're talking about movies, music, guys. Um, I never really talk about these big things. But that was the most interesting assignment I've ever had in my life, and I think that was the point when I decided to really think about these things and really have a discussion about this with some of my friends as well. It's something that we rarely discuss, but turns out it's really challenging to find out what you really trust, what you really believe in life. And actually, I, I still bring my binder with my personal portfolio in my bag. You can see it later on if you want to. That's, it was funny because last night I saw that again and I read it again and I laughed because it's still the things that I believe right now. And I didn't realize that everything I wrote there happened to me right now. So after I graduated from, um, from, no, before I graduated, it was me on my last year in university. At the time, I always knew that I want to be in advertising. Thank you. My dream is to be a creative director in an advertising agency. So when I was in my last year in high school, uh, in, in university, um, I need to apply for a job, for an internship. I said, I want to work in an advertising agency. And it happened. I work in an advertising agency. I have a name card. It said account executive. It sounds really, really cool. What I did every day, I pick up a phone and offering an advertisement space for everyone. Hi, I'm from da, da, da. Do you need an advertisement space in this blah, blah, blah? And hang up. That's what I did all day. And I hate it. <laughs> I was like, I'm not here for this. Like, I'm going to make phone calls all the time. And you know, this is it. This is adver advertising. Um, then that was my first introduction to working in an advertising agency. And then, um, fortunately, one of the senior, one of the manager in that company was actually a husband of my lecturer. And he came to me one day and he said, I heard about you from my wife. Um, he said, and he asked me, what are you doing here? <laughs> And I was like, why? Because you have a lot of potential. You should go for a better job rather than doing this all day. And I was like, yeah, I think so too. But you know, I just, I just started. I don't know anything. Maybe this is something that I need to do. And he said, no, try applying to this company. And at first, I was like, Ugh, it's the communication consultancy. It sounds all serious, nothing so exciting. It was like, but I want something in advertising. And he said, why don't you try this first? So I applied to that company, and I stayed there for nine and a half years in the company. Um, I think at first interview, I already fall in love with the company. Uh, my bosses kick ass. They're really cool. Uh, I love my colleagues. I love my job. And every day, I learn new things in this company. And who said that communications consultancy cannot be creative? They're really wrong. Um, so after a while, I started as, uh, in marketing communications at first, so working with brands, launching campaigns, and then I work with corporate communications. I do CSR programs, I sit down with my clients and decide this is the kind of CSR programs that you should do. And then after that, I learn about crisis management, go to the court every day, um, sitting down with lawyers and CEOs, deciding, okay, this is what should be appearing on the paper tomorrow. And you know, after a while, I realized that, hey, actually, at the time in the company, when you've been in the crisis team, it's like the highest thing that you can do there is being in the crisis team, it's like the elite team. And then I started getting anxious, like, what's next after this? And start questioning. At the time, there's, there's nothing. It's, 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 this is like, you've, you've gone through everything. 
So I decided that in my free time, I pursue my passion projects. So I always love writing. Um, since I was in elementary school, I always said I want to be a writer. So at those moments in my working days, I started going back to my blog. It's bradadisini.com. Started blogging. And then I started a social movement with my friend to send more kids back to school because there were years in my days when I didn't know whether I can continue going to school because I don't know whether I could afford it or my family could afford it. So I know how it feels when you don't really know whether you can go to school the next year. And so uh, with my friends, we started social movement in that to help kids from not dropping out. Um, and then I also started the photography and videography business with one of my colleagues. So I did all this in the midst of doing my daily work. It means um, I need to stay up late to do these things, or I need to use my weekends to work on these things, to do photo shoots and wake up at 4, 5 a.m. in the morning to catch the sunlight and get back to work on Monday morning, basically the 9 to 5 work. But, you know, I think when you do your passion projects, these are the things that makes you, you said it well before, it's something that makes you don't want to sleep. And it's worth it. I think all of us think that if we work on something that is our passion, it's going to be flowery, lovey-dovey, and dreamy, and you'll be happily forever, ever after. It's not. Passion in itself, it, the root word is from a Latin word, patior, which means to suffer or to endure. So a flip side of passion is suffering. And it's not about what you really like. It's about how much you really like something that you want to suffer for that, that you want to work so hard for that, that you want to get rejected 10, 20 times, but still believing in that. So that's the real passion. It's not only what you like, but how much sufferings would you like to endure for something that you really like. I think that's something that we sometimes forget when we talk about passion, because we always see the beautiful side of passion, but it's hard work. I have to sacrifice my sleeping time, my weekends, my time with friends, or with my boyfriends, just to, just to make sure that I can do this. Um, so after a while, um, I said, after doing all these passion projects, I came up to my boss and said, you know, I've, I've gone through everything here, I don't know what else I can learn in this company. And he said, so what do you want to learn? I said, well, actually, because I was blogging at the time and with Endel, we did Pasta Blogger, which is the National Bloggers Gathering. I said, I want to learn how communication consultancy can use digital for their communications, digital communications. But, you know, I know that we don't have that in our company. And he said, then why don't you go make it? So he challenged me to, you, you want digital communications? Okay, make it. So I, at first I worked by myself, like we have a digital division um, headed by me and the staff is me. <laughs> so one person division and then it grows until um, in one year, I think to eight to nine people were working on digital communications, using Facebook, Twitter, websites and advising our clients on how they can, on how brands and corporations can use digital channels um, to, to convey their messages or do campaigns or making games and whatever. And then after a while, okay, the digital is set up and I said, what's next? So I think one thing that I never want to stop doing is I, I want to keep learning new things because I think there's so many things in life that you can learn and you know there were times when you feel like you've known it all but there's always more things that you don't know so at the time finally I still remember um, my dream of becoming a creative director in an advertising agency and at the time after the digital is set we need someone who can create a content um, make something that is talkable and shareable in Twitter so basically it's the content creation how to combine text and photos and videos and make it cool. And so my boss told me, what about you becoming the creative director? And I was like, woohoo, finally. <laughs> so I get to creative director in a communications consultancy, not in an advertising agency, but still, I got there. Um, and so after being a creative director and with my experience in digital and everything, I got 
invited uh, mostly by the U.S. State Department to give talks and train um, NGOs and youth leaders on how they can use technology to foster good changes in the society. So I went to Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, um, India, and everywhere and try to teach um, the young leaders and NGO and activists on how they can use Facebook for fundraising or using Twitter to um, update status about the latest demonstration and everything. So that's when I catch the travel bug. I, after seeing the world, I wanted to see the world. So whenever I got invited for speaking, it's like usually two, three days of workshops and then I'll extend for four days and then for a week and then for two weeks. It's getting longer and longer every time. So I started traveling. Um, and then one day I wake up and I realize that, hey, I'm the creative director of the company. And, you know, if I want to climb the corporate ladder after director level, I'm going to be probably in five years, I'm going to be in the CEO level. Or I can move from the company and become a corporate communications director somewhere or a brand director somewhere. And then I ask myself, again, the same question I asked myself when I was in university and high school, you know, why, why am I doing this? What for? At first it was to learn, right? And then I realized, what is it that I need to learn right now? And then I see, one day I see my, my bosses and I see these directors in multinational companies and I ask myself, do I want to be like them five years from now? Going out to work at seven, you know, in the traffic and then sit in my desk talking to my employees, do I want that? And I said, no, I don't want that. So I asked myself the third question, which is what is it that you really, really, really want? I said, okay, I wanna wake up at, at eight uh, in the morning, uh, make my juice and breakfast, do yoga, <laughs> drink coffee, then probably check emails and then write and then go swimming. Um, so it's a life, um, that, that I imagine that, you know, I can choose my own clients, you know, because when you're working in a company, you cannot choose your clients. You work on clients that the company told you to work on. I want to choose my own clients. I want to be able to work more with NGOs. Um, so I said, if I want that, it means that I have to quit my job. Because if not, I will just go climbing the corporate ladder and that's not where I want to go. It's like you're climbing a mountain Halfway up there, you want to go to the top, and then you realize, no, this is not the mountain that I want to climb. You know, you can keep on climbing and go to the top, but it means that you need to climb down further and take a longer time to climb down. So I decided, hey, turns out that it's not the mountain that I want to climb. So I quit my job at the age of 30. Um, and at the time, I decided to go freelancing. I thought it's gonna be like that, you know, wake up at eight, yoga and everything, it's very zen-like, meditate all day by the beach. Uh, well, it happens for a while until I realize the reality kicks in, I don't get my monthly check. <laughs> and after keeping that lifestyle, I was like, oh no, I need to get some real money now. Um, so really at the time, the first six months is very difficult. Um, I almost tempted to go back to 9 to 5 work because I had offers and said maybe I should take that job. Um, but I decided to hold on until I cannot take it anymore. So I made a promise to myself, if you can't take it anymore, if you got really, really, really broke, then you go back. But if not, if you can still eat and drink coffee, you can do it. So I do it. Um, so I persevere in that I call my ex-clients and said, hey, I'm already on my own. I meet people, go networking and everything. And so then jobs started coming. And basically now I can work from everywhere because my clients are in Singapore, in Morocco, in Japan. So we do conference call and I can work from the beach and everything, you know, and it looks nice. You know, people said, you have a very nice life. And I said, oh, because you see it in Instagram. <laughs> you didn't see the moments I did not Instagram. <laughs> it was the moment when I feel, you know, so depressed, so miserable, you know, trying to get a job and contacting everyone. I didn't Instagram that, of course. You only see <laughs> the beautiful ones, but it's not always beautiful because of the passion, the willingness to suffer. 
So I think what I'm going to leave you today is, you know, why don't you choose your own title in the world and start asking yourself, if you can give a title for yourself, what do you want to choose for yourself and live to that? I'm Hani from BradaDisney.com. Thank you so much.